Dr. Zixnex, lead exonobiologist at the Galactic Science Council, stared at the readings on his holographic display with a mixture of fascination and horror. His tentacles quivered with excitement as he called out to his research team by the seven moons of Zirgon. Everyone, come quickly. You won't believe what I'm seeing. The lab erupted into a flurry of activity as various alien species scuttled, slithered, and floated towards the central console. Dr. Gloop, a gelatinous mass of sentient ooze, squelched his way to the front, leaving a trail of slime that the poor intern would later have to mop up. What is it, Zex? Don't tell me the humans have done something ridiculous again, Gloop burbled, his voice a mixture of exasperation and amusement. Zynex Nex's eye stalks swivelled towards his amorphous colleague. Oh, it's worse than ridiculous, my dear Gloop. It's... He paused for dramatic effect, his antennae twitching with anticipation. It's non-tastic. The assembled scientists groaned in unison, a cacophony of alien sounds that would have sent any human running for the hills, thinking they'd stumbled into a zoo for otherworldly creatures with indigestion. Zix, I swear by the cosmic jello, if this is another one of your terrible puns. Gloop began, but was cut off by a sudden tremor that shook the entire research station. It was blared as the station's AI announced in a calm, robotic voice. Warning. Seismic activity detected on Earth's surface. Magnitude. Holy shit on the I-what-the-fuck scale. Dr. Kears, the resident physicist whose species communicated through interpretive dance, began spinning in circles and flailing his limbs wildly. The other scientists watched in bewilderment until Dr. Florp, the linguistic expert, translated, he says. Oh, no, not again. Last time this happened, it was because a human stubbed their toe. The memory of that incident sent shivers down the spines of those who had them. The resulting tantrum had caused a localized hurricane and reshaped part of Florida's coastline. The humans had simply shrugged it off as Florida being Florida. As the station continued to shake, the scientists huddled around the main viewscreen, which showed a live feed of the Earth's surface. They zoomed in on the epicenter of the disturbance, a small town in the American Midwest. Enhanced Sector 7, Zang's Nax, commanded, his voice trembling with a mixture of fear and scientific curiosity. The image zoomed in further, revealing a quaint suburban street and there, standing on her front porch, was the source of all the commerce. A human female in a bathrobe, stretching her arms above her head, by the great void, whispered Dr. Ari Silophone. Yes, that was actually his name, much to the amusement of his human colleagues. She's yawning. The entire research team exclaimed in unison, their voices a chorus of disbelief and awe. Indeed, the human woman was in the midst of a monstrous yawn, her jaw open wide enough to swallow a small moon. The force of her exhalation was causing trees to bend, car alarms to go off, and a nearby squirrel to cling desperately to a branch, its tiny paws gripping for dear life. Quick, someone calculate the energy output. Zick snacks, shouted, his tentacles flying across the holographic interface. Dr. Pythagoras, the mathematics expert, and yes, he was distantly related to Bythigaras. Through a series of improbable interstellar events involving a time machine, a misplaced theorem, and a drunken knight in ancient Greece, began scribbling furiously on a floating chalkboard, carrying the two, dividing by the square root of impossible. Great galaxies. The energy released by this single yawn is equivalent to... Spit it out, man. Gloop gurgled impatiently. It's equivalent to the entire energy output of a Taibai civilization on the Kardashev scale. A collective gasp echoed through the lab, followed by the sound of Dr. Krizic fainting and flopping to the floor like a fish out of water. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Jessica Martinez, for was the name of our unwitting chaos bringer, finished her epic yawn, smacked her lips, and muttered to herself, Man, I really need some coffee aware of the pandemonium she had just caused in the scientific community orbiting her planet. Jessica shuffled back inside her house, leaving a trail of destruction in her wake. A neighbor's garden down low toppled, its tiny ceramic eyes filled with terror. A newspaper that had been peacefully resting on a driveway 
was now wrapped around a stop sign two blocks away, and somewhere in the distance a car alarm wailed in harmony with a dog's confused howling back on the research station. The aliens were in full panic mode. Dr. Gloop had liquefied himself in shock and was now a puddle on the floor, burbling incoherently about the end times. Cellophane was playing a frantic tune on himself, his bony fingers tapping out a rhythm that sounded suspiciously like We Will Rock You by Queen. Even the normally stoic Dr. Zixnax was pacing back and forth, his tentacles tied in knots. We must alert the Galactic Council immediately. He declared, reaching for the big red button labelled in case of human shenanigans, press here, but before his tentacle could make contact, a voice of reason cut through the chaos. Wait. It was Dr. Florp, the linguist, who'd been quietly observing the situation. Before we cause an interstellar incident, perhaps we should consult our human expert. A hush fell over the lab as all eyes and other sensory organs turned to a dark corner of the room. There, sitting in a comically oversized chair and sipping from a mug that read World's Best Human, on this station was Dr. Jake Thompson, the lone human member of their research team. Jake lowered his coffee mug, a bemused expression on his face. You guys done freaking out? Can I explain now? Zixnex nodded his eye stalks vigorously. Please, Dr. Thompson, enlighten us about this, this, yawn. Jake offered helpfully. Yes, this apocalyptic yawn that threatens to tear the very fabric of space-time. Zixnax finished dramatically. Jake couldn't help but chuckle, which caused several of the more nervous aliens to duck for cover. Relax, everyone. It's just a normal human bodily function. We do it when we're tired or bored, but... But the energy readings, sputtered Dr. Pythagoras, waving his chalkboard frantically. Jake stood up stretching his arms above his head in a motion that made half the room flinch. Look, I know we humans seem pretty intense to you guys, but trust me, a yawn is harmless. Watch. And with that, Jake let out a massive yawn of his own. The effect was immediate and hilarious. Dr. Glip solidified into a perfect cube of terror. Dr. Kez, who had just regained consciousness, promptly fainted again. Dr. Xalophone played a discordant tune that sounded like a cat walking across a piano keyboard. As the yawn subsided, Jake smacked his lips and grinned at his alien colleagues. See? No earthquakes, no torn space-time continuum. Just a sleepy human. Dr. Zoix approached Jake cautiously, his tentacles still slightly knotted. But how? How do you contain such power? The readings we got from that female human's yawn were off the charts, Jake shrugged, a motion that caused several nearby aliens to instinctively duck. Honestly, we don't even notice it most of the time. It's like blinking or breathing for us. Fascinating, murmured Dr. Florp, who had been taking notes. And you say this happens when you're bored or tired? Yeah, Jake confirmed, taking another sip of his coffee. Speaking of which who's up for a PowerPoint presentation on the history of human tax law. The resulting groan from the alien scientists was so powerful it caused a minor fluctuation in the station's gravity field. Aha! Jake exclaimed triumphantly. See? You guys can cause some pretty impressive reactions too when you're bored or annoyed. Dr. Zixnax's eye stalks drooped in embarrassment. Perhaps we may have overreacted slightly, slightly. Jake raised an eyebrow. You were about to call the Galactic Council over a yawn. I'd hate to see how you'd react to a sneeze. The mere mention of the word sneeze caused a ripple of panic through the assembled aliens. Dr. Gloop, who had just reformed into his usual blob shape, promptly melted again. Oh no, Jake muttered, realizing his mistake. Guys, I was joking. But it was too late. The alien scientists were already in full research mode, their earlier panic forgotten in the face of this new, potentially catastrophic human bodily function. Quick, we must set up monitoring stations around every human population centre, Dr. Zixnax declared, his tentacles flying across the holographic interface. We need to be prepared for any potential sneeze-based disasters. Jake facepalmed so hard it echoed through the lab causing several sensitive instruments to recalibrate themselves. This is going to be a long day, he muttered into his palm. 
as the research station erupted into a flurry of activity, with aliens scrambling to prepare for the imagined sneeze apocalypse. Jake couldn't help but laugh. He made a mental note to never, ever tell them about hiccups. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Jessica Martinez had finally gotten her coffee. As she took her first sip, she felt a familiar tickle in her nose. Ah, Aku. The resulting sneeze sent her coffee mug flying across the kitchen, startled her cat into achieving temporary flight, and caused her neighbor's wind chimes to play the opening notes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Jessica sniffled, grabbed a tissue, and muttered to herself, Hmm, must be allergy season. Little did she know that in orbit above her, a team of panic alien scientists had just declared a level 10 Gesundheit alert. As the day progressed, the situation on the research station grew increasingly absurd. Dr. Zixnax had ordered the deployment of what he called sneeze detectors to major human population centers. In reality, these were just repurposed atmospheric sensors with Akul meter, hastily scribbled on them in alien script. Jake watched in bemused silence as his colleagues scurried about, preparing for a disaster that would never come. He considered telling them that humans sneezed on average about four times a day, but decided against it. The resulting panic might cause the station to accidentally eject itself into deep space. Dr. Thompson, it was Dr. Florp, the linguist approaching with a stack of papers. I've been analysing human languages, and I've made a startling discovery. Jake braced himself. Oh, what's that, Flor? It seems that humans have developed specific verbal responses to these sneezes. Phrases like, bless you, gaike sundite, and salute. Clearly, these must be incantations to ward off the destructive power of the sneeze. Jake bit his lip to keep from laughing. Ah, uh, not exactly, Florp. They're just polite sayings. It's considered good manners to acknowledge when someone sneezes. Dr. Florp's antenna drooped in disappointment. Oh, so they're not magical protection. Nope. Sorry, buddy. Jake patted the alien what he hoped was its shoulder. Just plain old human politeness. Across the lab, Dr. Pythagoras was furiously scribbling equations on his floating chalkboard. If we factor in the average human sneeze velocity of 100 miles per hour, multiply by the global human population, and divide by the number of cats' videos on the internet, Pythagoras, Jay called out, what you're working on there. The mathematician turned, his eyes wild with the fervor of scientific discovery. I'm calculating the potential impact if every human on Earth sneezed simultaneously. My preliminary results suggest it could knock the planet out of orbit. Jake pinched the bridge of his nose. Pythagoras, buddy, that's not how sneezes work. Or physics, for that matter. But the alien was already back at his chalkboard, muttering about sneeze-based propulsion systems and the possibility of using synchronized human sneezes to power interstellar travel. Meanwhile, Dr. Gloop had taken it upon himself to design protective gear for the inevitable sneeze magenten. He had covered himself in what looked like a combination of bubble wrap, aluminum foil, and rubber duckies. Gloop! Jake approached the now spherical scientist cautiously. What's all this? Anti-sneeze armor! Gloop burbled proudly, his voice muffled by layers of protection. Guaranteed to withstand even the mightiest of human expulsions, a mighty tie in the futility of such armor when the station's AI announced. Attention all personnel. A level 10 Gesundheit alert has been declared in Sector 7. This is not a drill. Repeat. Lib erupted into chaos. Dr. Kist began his interpretive dance of panic, which looked suspiciously like the Macarena. Dr. Exilophone played a frantic rendition of Flight of the Bumblebee on himself, and Dr. Gloop. Well, Dr. Gloop just rolled around helplessly in his bubble-wrapped state bouncing off walls and other scientists, Jake sighed deeply and made his way to the main console. Everyone calm down, he shouted, his voice echoing through the lab with enough force to make several aliens instinctively molt. As silence fell, Jake pulled up the live feed from Sector 7. There, on the screen, was Jessica Martinez again. She was in her backyard, tending to her garden, completely oblivious to the interstellar panic she had caused. See? Everything's fine. She probably just sneezed while gardening. 
no earthquakes, no disasters, no planet knocked out of orbit. Dr. Zixnex's eye stalks swivel towards Jake, but, but the energy readings, the potential for destruction. Jake smiled patiently. Zix, remember when you guys first discovered humans and thought we were some kind of invincible death monsters? The alien scientist's tentacles twisted in embarrassment. Well, you have to admit, your planet is rather... In true, Jake conceded. But we've adapted to it. What seems extreme to you is just everyday life for us. Yawns, sneezes, hiccups. They're all just part of being human. A collective gasp went through the lab at the mention of hiccups. Jake quickly added. And no, we're not going to start a new panic over hiccups. They're harmless too, I promise. Dr. Florp raised a tentacle timidly. But what about the humans' gardening activities? Surely digging into the planet's surface must cause some form of geological instability. Jake couldn't help but laugh. Florp is just a hobby. She's planting flowers, not mining for core samples. If on cue, the live feed showed Jessica standing up, brushing dirt from her knees, and admiring her handiwork. A row of freshly planted petunias stood proudly in the afternoon sun. You see? Jake gestured to the screen. No terraforming, no geological reconstruction, just a human enjoying a bit of nature. The alien scientist watched in fascination as Jessica went about her gardening, occasionally pausing to wipe her brow or take a sip of water. To their amazement, the planet remained stubbornly intact, refusing to crack open or explode as their worst fears had suggested. Dr. Zixnack's tentacles twisted in confusion. But, but how? Our instruments detected seismic activity equivalent to a magnitude 8 earthquake when she yawned. Jake chuckled, shaking his head. Zix, buddy, I think it's time we had a little chat about the calibration of your equipment. You guys are measuring human activities on a scale designed for planetary events. It's like using a telescope to look at a grain of sand. Dr. Pythagoras, who'd been unusually quiet, suddenly perked up. Of course, we've been approaching this all wrong. We need to recalibrate our entire measurement system to account for the... the... He paused, searching for the right word. The human factor? Jake offered with a grin. Precisely. Pythagoras exclaimed, his chalk flying across the board, as he began a new set of calculations. If we adjust our baseline to account for the average human's daily activities, we can create a more accurate model of Earth's actual seismic path. As the mathematician worked, the other scientists gathered around, their earlier panic forgotten in the face of this new scientific challenge. Even Dr. Gloop had managed to free himself from his makeshift armour and was now eagerly watching the proceedings, leaving a trail of bubble wrap and rubber duckies in his wake. Jake smiled to himself, relieved that the crisis had been averted and proud, that his alien colleagues were finally starting to understand humanity a little better. But just as he was about to suggest they all take a break for some much-needed refreshments, and perhaps a lesson in human biology, the station's AI chimed in again, unusual atmospheric disturbance detected in Sector 7, potential threat level. The lab fell silent as all eyes turned to the main screen. There, in her backyard, Jessica Martinez was standing up, brushing dirt from her knees and taking a deep breath. She looked up at the sky her face scrunching up in an odd expression. Oh no, Jake muttered, realisation dawning on him. Guys, whatever you do, don't... But it was too late. Jessica's face contorted, her mouth and nose scrunching up, and then, at you. The sneeze echoed through the lab speakers, causing several of the more sensitive aliens to vibrate at an alarming frequency. On the screen, leaves rustled violently. A nearby bird was sent tumbling through the air, and Jessica's cat, which had been lounging on a garden chair, suddenly found itself clinging to the top of a fence post, looking utterly bewildered. The reaction in the lab was instant and chaotic. Dr. Christ began a frenzied dance that looked like a cross between the chicken dance and a seizure. Dr. Xylophone played a discordant tune that sounded suspiciously like the theme from Jaws and Dr. Gloop. Well, Dr. Gloop simply melted into a puddle of goo, burbling what sounded like alien prayers. Silence. Jake's voice boomed through the lab, instantly quieting the pandemonium. 
Everyone, take a deep breath. Well, those of you who breathe, anyway. He turned to the main console and pulled up a split-screen view. On one side was Jessica, sniffling slightly and reaching for a tissue. On the other was a wide view of the Earth, spinning peacefully in space, decidedly undestroyed. See? The planet's fine. No earthquakes, no tsunamis, no rips in the space-time continuum. Just a normal, everyday human sneeze. Dr. Zixnax's eye stalks swiveled between the two images, his tentacles twitching in confusion. But the readings, the energy output, it's off the charts, Jake sighed, rubbing his temples. He was starting to understand why humans in alien encounter movies always look so exasperated. Okay. Let's try this another way. Zix, remember when we first met, and you tried to communicate by rapidly changing colors. The alien scientist's skin flushed a deep purple, the equivalent of a human blush. Yes, I recall. You said it gave you a headache and asked me to stop before you, and I quote, turned into a walking rave party. Exactly, Jake nodded. What seems normal to you can be overwhelming to us, and vice versa. A sneeze might register as a seismic event on your instruments, but to us, it's just Tuesday. The assembled scientists murmured among themselves, a cacophony of clicks, whistles and squelches that Jake had long ago learned to interpret as the alien equivalent of OH. Now we get it. Dr. Floor, ever the linguist, was the first to speak up. So you're saying that what we perceive as catastrophic events are simply... Mundane bodily functions to humans. Got it in one? Florp, Jake grinned. Though I wouldn't go around calling sneezes mundane to other humans. Some of them are quite proud of their sneezing abilities. This statement caused another round of confused murmuring among the aliens. Dr. Pythagoras, his chalkboard now covered in a complex array of equations and doodles that looked suspiciously like human emojis, raised a tentacle. Dr. Thompson, if I may... Are you suggesting that humans intentionally cultivate and enhance these bodily functions? Perhaps as some form of competitive sport or mating ritual, Jake couldn't help but burst out laughing, a sound that caused several nearby instruments to recalibrate themselves. Oh man, Pythagoras, you're not far off. You should see some of the sneeze compilations on YouTube. But no, it's not a sport or a mating ritual. Although he trailed off, a mischievous glint in his eye. The alien scientists leaned in, their various sensory organs twitching with anticipation. Well, Jake continued, struggling to keep a straight face, there is this one human tradition. It said that if you sneeze seven times in a row, you achieve temporary enlightenment. The lab erupted into a frenzy of excited chittering and burbling. Dr. Zixnex's tentacles were typing furiously on his console, likely drafting a research proposal on the metaphysical properties of sequential human expulsions, Dr. Gloop had reformed into a shape that vaguely resembled a human nose, complete with bubbling nostrils. Jake bit his lip, trying desperately not to laugh. He knew he should probably come clean about the joke, but the sight of Dr. Kirzist attempting to recreate a human sneeze through interpretive dance was just too priceless. As the excitement in the lab reached fever pitch, with talks of expeditions to Earth to study this sneeze enlightenment phenomenon. The station's AI chimed in once again, Baton, multiple atmospheric disturbances detected in various sectors. Disturbance pattern matches previous sneeze events. The main screen lit up with a global view of Earth, small points of light popping up all over the surface, like a stellar cartography gone wrong. Oh boy, Jake muttered, realizing the can of worms he'd inadvertently opened. Huh? Guys? I think I need to explain something about human allergies and pollen seasons. But his words were drowned out by the sound of Dr. Xulophone playing a triumphant fanfare and Dr. Zixnax, declaring, Prepare the research vessels. We shall unlock the secrets of human sneeze enlightenment. As the lab descended into cheerful chaos, with aliens preparing for what they believed would be the scientific discovery of the millennium, Jake slumped into his oversized chair and took a long sip of his now cold coffee. Note to self, he murmured. Watching his colleagues scurry about in excitement. Next time, start with a lesson on human sarcasm. Meanwhile, back on Earth, 
Jessica Martinez was finishing up her gardening, blissfully unaware of the interstellar commotion she had caused. As she stood up to admire her handiwork, she felt another tickle in her nose. Ah! A coup! The sneeze sent a nearby garden gnome tumbling and caused her neighbor's wind chimes to play a perfect C major scale. Jessica sniffled, wiped her nose, and muttered to herself, Geez, seven sneezes in a row. If I didn't know better, I'd think I was about to achieve enlightenment or something. She chuckled at her own joke and headed inside for a glass of water, leaving behind a garden that, despite her earth-shaking sneezes, looked positively sublime and high above. A team of alien scientists prepared to embark on what would surely be the most ridiculous research expedition in the history of the galaxy. As the day wore on, the research station became a hive of activity. Aliens of all shapes and sizes scurried about, preparing for what they believed would be a groundbreaking expedition to study the mystical properties of human sneezes. Jake watched it all unfold with a mixture of amusement and growing concern. Dr. Zixnex had set up a holographic display of Earth, with little blinking lights representing each detected sneeze. The alien scientist tentacles danced across the controls, zooming in and out of different regions. Fascinating, he exclaimed, his eye stalks quivering with excitement. There seems to be a higher concentration of sneezes in certain geographical areas. Perhaps these are sacred sneeze sites. Jake pinched the bridge of his nose, trying to stifle a laugh. Zix, those are just areas with high pollen counts. It's allergy season in those parts of Earth. But Zyke's moss too engrossed in his discovery to listen. Quick, we must prepare the sneeze seekers. The what now? Jake asked, almost afraid to hear the answer. As if on cue, a group of aliens waddled into the lab, each encased in what looked like a giant humanoid nose costume. The costumes were complete with flaring nostrils and what appeared to be, yes, those were definitely tissues attached to the sides. Behold, Dr. Gloop burbled proudly, having apparently appointed himself chief costume designer. The sneeze seekers, designed to blend seamlessly with human nasal apparatus and collect sneeze data undetected, Jake stared at the costume-clad aliens, who were bumping into each other and various pieces of equipment, as they tried to navigate the lab with their limited vision. One of them accidentally activated the fire suppression system, causing a rain of foam to descend upon the chaos. Guys, Jake said, trying to keep his voice steady. I really think we need to have a talk about human perception and the concept of blending. But his words were drowned out by Dr. Xylophone, who had composed what he called the Sneeze Symphony and was now performing it with great gusto. The discordant notes echoed through the lab, causing several sensitive instruments to spark and smoke. As Jake watched the scene unfold, he couldn't help but wonder how his life had led to this moment. Here he was, the lone human on an alien research station, watching a group of extraterrestrial scientists prepare to invade Earth disguised as giant noses, all because of a misunderstood yawn and a joke about sneezing. Suddenly an idea struck him. If he couldn't beat them, maybe he could at least steer this ridiculous expedition in a less potentially disastrous direction. Wait, he shouted, his voice cutting through the chaos. I just remembered something important about the sneeze enlightenment ritual. The lab fell silent, all eyes and other sensory organs turning to Jake. You see, he continued, trying to keep a straight face, the seven sneezes must be witnessed by a, a sneeze sage. Without the presence of a certified sneeze sage, the enlightenment ritual is incomplete. Dr. Florp's antennae twitched curiously, a sneeze sage. Is this some sort of human spiritual leader? Jake nodded solemnly, warming to his tail. Oh yes, very important figures in human society. They're the keepers of sneeze law, the guardians of nasal wisdom. No proper sneeze study can be conducted without one. The aliens huddled together, chittering and burbling in excited discussion. Finally, Dr. Zixnax turned to Jake, his eye stalks quivering with anticipation. Dr. Thompson, he said. His voice filled with reverence. Would you... would you consider becoming our sneeze sage? Jake pretended to ponder the question, stroking his chin thoughtfully.
Inside, he was trying desperately not to burst into laughter. Well, he said finally, it is a great responsibility. But for the sake of science and interstellar understanding, I ex The lab erupted into cheers. Dr. Kiraist began a celebratory dance that looked suspiciously like the funky chicken. Dr. Gloop formed himself into a blob shaped vaguely like a party hat, and Dr. Oilophone played a triumphant tune that sounded like a cross between pomp and circumstance and a cat walking across a keyboard. As the celebration continued around him, Jake allowed himself a small smile. He had bought himself some time and, more importantly, ensured that he would be part of this ridiculous expedition. At least now he had a chance of preventing an interstellar incident triggered by a bunch of aliens in nose costumes running a morgue on Earth. All right, all right, he said, raising his hands to quiet the excited aliens. As your newly appointed sneeze sage, I have some important preparations to make. First things first, we need to redesign those sneeze seeker costumes. Dr. Gloop's form rippled with indignation. But, but they're perfect, exact replicas of human nasal apparatus, Jake suppressed a chuckle. Trust me, Gloop, if we want to blend in with humans, we're going to need something a little less nosy. How about we go with something simpler, like, say, tourists? And so, as the Earth continued its rotation below, blissfully unaware of the chaos, it had sparked above. Jake found himself giving an impromptu lesson on human fashion, to a group of eager alien scientists. It was going to be a long night, but as he watched Dr. Zixnex try to figure out how to wear a Hawaiian shirt with his tentacles, Jake couldn't help but think that his job was, without a doubt, the most interesting in the galaxy. Little did he know that back on Earth, Jessica Martinez was settling in for a night of binge watching her favorite TV show, armed with a box of tissues and some allergy medication. As she pressed play on the first episode, she let out another massive yawn, completely unaware that some were up in orbit. A room full of alien scientists were about to spill their celebratory drinks in shock at the readings on their instruments. Just another day in the life of an unsuspecting human, and the exasperated earthling tasked with keeping the galaxy from freaking out over a simple bodily function, as the Earth completed another rotation, blissfully unaware of the interstellar kerfuffle it sparked. The alien research station was abuzz with activity. The halls echoed with the sounds of excited chittering, burbling, and the occasional clang of someone tripping over their hastily assembled human costume. Jake found himself in the uninviable position of trying to teach a crash course in blending in with humans 101 to a group of eager but utterly clueless alien scientists. He stood at the front of the lab, which had been hastily converted into a classroom complete with a holographic projector, showing images of Earth fashion and tourist attractions. OK, everyone, Jake said, clapping his hands to get their attention. Let's review. What's rule number one when we're on Earth? Dr. Zixnex's tentacles shot up eagerly. Ooh, ooh, I know this one. Don't probe the humans. Jake pinched the bridge of his nose, letting out a long-suffering sigh. Yes, Zixnex technically correct. But I was thinking more along the lines of act natural. Dr. Florp's antennae twitched in confusion. But Jake, how can we act natural when we're pretending to be humans? Isn't that the opposite of natural for us? Good point, Florp Jake nodded. I should rephrase that. Act like you think a human would act. And remember, tourists are expected to act a little weird, so we've got some wiggle room. He turned to the holographic display, flipping through images of popular tourist destinations. Now, let's review our cover story. We're a group of tourists from, where did we decide again? Canada. The aliens chorused enthusiastically. Jake nodded, suppressing a smile. Right, Canada. Good choice. Remote enough to explain any odd behavior, but not so exotic as to draw too much attention. Dr. Gloop raised a pseudopode. But Jake... I've been practicing my Canadian accent, eh? Don't you want to hear it? Jake's eyes widened in alarm. Ah, that's okay, Gloop. Let's stick to as little talking as possible. Remember, we're there to observe, not to chat. Dr. Thagoras, who had been uncharacteristically quiet, suddenly perked up. I've been analyzing human tourist behavior patterns, 
and I've made an important discovery. He held up his chalkboard, which was covered in complex equations and what looked suspiciously like doodles of humans taking selfies. According to my calculations, Pythagoras continued excitedly, 87.3 of human tourist activity involves pointing at things and making sounds of appreciation. I propose we focus our efforts on mastering these crucial skills. Jake couldn't help but laugh. You know what, Pythagoras? You're not far off. All right, everyone, let's practice our pointing and ooking. What followed was perhaps the most surreal lesson in human behavior ever conducted. Aliens of all shapes and sizes awkwardly extended limbs or pudipodes or tentacles in approximations of pointing, while making sounds that ranged from passable oohs and yars to noises that sounded more like malfunctioning machinery. Dr. Kiers, ever the overachiever, had somehow incorporated pointing into an interpretive dance that looked like a cross between the Macarena and a seizure. Dr. Xylophone, taking the lesson perhaps too literally, had started playing a tune that sounded vaguely like Ooh, Canada. As Jake watched the chaos unfold, he couldn't help but wonder if he was making a terrible mistake. But then again, the alternative was letting these well-meaning but clueless aliens loose on Earth without any preparation. At least this way, he had a chance of preventing an interstellar incident. All right, all right, he said, clapping his hands to regain their attention. That's, uh, that's great progress, everyone. Now, Let's move on to our most important rule. What happens if you see someone sneeze? The room fell silent. All eyes and other sensory organs fixed on Jake with rapt attention. Remember, Jake continued, his voice serious. No matter how exciting it is, no matter how much you want to rush over and take readings or collect samples, what do we do? We say, bless you and move on. The aliens chorused, sounding a bit deflated. Exactly, Jake nodded. We're not there to study sneezes, remember. We're just ordinary tourists doing ordinary tourist things. The sneezes are just background noise. Dr. Zignac's tentacles drooped in disappointment. But Jake, he protested, what about the sneeze enlightenment? The sacred sneeze sites. The nasal wisdom we came to uncover. Jake sighed, realizing it was time to come clean. Look, guys, I need to tell you something. The whole sneeze enlightenment thing. It was just a joke. Humans don't actually gain enlightenment from sneezing. The lab erupted into a cacophony of alien sounds expressing shock, disbelief, and in Dr. Gloop's case, a noise that sounded suspiciously like a deflating balloon. But, but Dr. Florp's antennae were tying themselves in knots. All our research, our theories, the sneeze-seeker costumes. I know, I know, Jake said, holding up his hands placatingly and I'm sorry for misleading you. But guys, think about it. Wouldn't you rather learn about real human behavior, about how we actually live and interact? That's way more interesting than some made-up sneeze ritual, right? The aliens huddle together, chittering and burbling in heated discussion. Finally, Dr. Zixnax turned to Jake, his eye stalks drooping slightly. We understand, Jake, and we appreciate your honesty. But tell us, if not to study sneezes, why are we going to Earth? Jake grinned, a mischievous glint in his eye, to have fun, of course, and maybe, just maybe, to learn that humans are more than just the sum of our biological functions. We're complex, weird, wonderful beings, just like you guys. And the best way to understand us isn't through a telescope or a sneeze detector, but by walking among us, seeing our world through your eyes. A moment of silence fell over the lab as the aliens pondered his words. Then. Slowly but surely, excitement began to build again. Dr. Quiz started a new dance that looked suspiciously like the chicken dance. Dr. Silophon played a tune that sounded almost like walking on sunshine. And Dr. Gloop, well, Dr. Gloop just sort of bubbled happily. All right, team, Jake said, clapping his hands together. Let's get ready for the best alien tourist invasion Earth has never seen. As the aliens scurried off to make final preparations, Jake allowed himself a moment of quiet reflection. Sure, this whole situation was utterly ridiculous, but in a weird way, it was also kind of beautiful. They were beings from across the galaxy, so different from humans in almost every way, yet driven by the same curiosity, the same desire to understand and connect. Maybe, just maybe, this absurd adventure would lead to real understanding between their species, and if not, 
Well, at least it would make one hell of a story for his next performance review. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Jessica Martinez was just settling into bed after a long day of gardening and binge-watching. As she drifted off to sleep, she let out one final, massive yawn. Up in orbit, alarms blared as the station's sensors detected what they interpreted as a seismic event of cataclysmic proportions. But this time, instead of panic, the alien scientists merely chuckled and went about their business. They were learning slowly but surely that when it came to humans, sometimes a yawn was just a yawn. As Earth continued its quiet rotation, blissfully unaware of the motley crew of alien tourists about to descend upon it, the stage was set for what would surely be the most ridiculous and heartwarming interstellar cultural exchange in the history of the galaxy. The day of the Great Earth Expedition had finally arrived. The alien research station was a flurry of activity as final preparations were made. Disguises were donned, Earth customs were rehearsed one last time, and an inordinate amount of sunscreen was applied to perhaps overemphasize the dangers of Earth's sun to his UV-sensitive colleagues. As they boarded the cloaked shuttle that would take them to Earth's surface, Jake couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and trepidation. He looked over his ragtag team of alien tourists and had to stifle a laugh. Dr. Zixnex had somehow managed to wear a Hawaiian shirt over his tentacles, the bright floral pattern clashing magnificently with his natural bioluminescence. Dr. Gloop had formed himself into a shape vaguely resembling a rotund human, complete with a kiss, the cold apron, and a foam finger that read Earth One. Dr. Pythagoras was clutching a comically large map of Earth, upside down. Dr. Flop had attached a series of fanny packs to various parts of his body, each one bulging with what Jake could only assume were alien snacks and possibly illegal Earth scanning equipment. All right, team, Jake said, trying to keep a straight face. Remember our cover story. We're just a normal group of Canadian tourists, excited to see the sights. What do we do if we see someone sneeze, say bless you and move on? The aliens chorus dutifully. And what don't we do? Oh, the humans, Dr. Zixnax exclaimed proudly. Jake pinched the bridge of his nose. Yes, Zix, but also, we don't take readings, we don't collect samples, and we absolutely do not try to achieve sneeze enlightenment. Got it. A chorus of disappointed alien noises answered him. As the shuttle began its descent towards Earth, cloaking device engaged, Jake couldn't help but wonder what he had gotten himself into. But it was too late to back out now. Earth, ready or not, was about to experience the most unusual tourist group in its history. They touched down in a secluded area just outside the small Midwestern town where Jessica Martinez lived. As the aliens filed out of the shuttle, their eyes and other sensory organs, wide with wonder, Jake gave them one final pep talk. OK, everyone, remember, act natural. We're just here to observe and enjoy. No probing, no scanning, and for the love of all that's holy, no interpretive dance routines about human biology. Dr. Kuzast's lower appendages drooped in disappointment. As they made their way into town, Jay couldn't help but feel a surge of pride. Despite their odd appearances and occasional missteps, Dr. Gloop had a tendency to leave a slight slime trail. His alien colleagues were doing their best to blend in. They pointed at buildings, took photos with cameras they held upside down, and made valiant attempts at small talk with bewildered locals. Everything was going surprisingly well until they reached the town square. There, tending to a public garden, was none other than Jessica Martinez herself. And as fate would have it, at that very moment, she stood up, stretched, and let out an enormous yawn. The effect on the alien scientists was immediate and comical. Dr. Zixnex's tentacles began waving frantically, nearly knocking off an old lady's hat. Dr. Pythagoras started scribbling equations in the air with an imaginary pen. Dr. Florp's antennae stood straight up, quivering with excitement. No, 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 Jake hissed, trying to hurt his awestruck colleagues away from the scene. Remember the plan? She's just a normal human doing normal human things. Nothing to see here. But it was too late. Jessica, noticing the odd group, walked over with a friendly smile. Hi there. You folks look a bit lost. Can I help you with anything? Jake opened his mouth to politely decline, but Dr. Gloop, in his excitement, beat him to it. Greetings, Earth female. We come in peace to study your magnificent nasal exhalations, 
A moment of awkward silence fell over the group. Jake felt a bead of sweat trickle down his forehead as Jessica's smile froze in confusion. I'm sorry, she said slowly. My what now? Jake jumped in, laughing nervously. Oh, don't mind my friend here. He's, uh, he's Canadian. You know how those Canadians are with their uh, nasal humour? Jessica raised an eyebrow, clearly not buying it. Mm-hmm. And I suppose all Canadians have tentacles and leave slime trails. It's a regional thing, Jake said weakly. Just then, as if the universe itself had a twisted sense of humour, Jessica's nose twitched. Her eyes scrunched up, and before anyone could react, she let out an enormous sneeze. Aku. The reaction from the alien scientists was instantaneous and chaotic. Dr. Crisp began a frenzied dance that looked like a cross between the Macarena and a seizure. Dr. Xylophone, who had been hiding in a nearby bush, popped out playing a triumphant fanfare, and Dr. Gloop. Well, Dr. Gloop simply melted into a puddle of excited goo. As Jessica stared in wide-eyed shock at the scene unfolding before her, Jake realized that the jig was up. There was no salvaging their cover story now. He took a deep breath, looked Jessica in the eye, and said the words he never thought he'd say to another human being. So, how would you like to learn about alien sneezing customs? And that, dear readers, is how Jessica Martinez, amateur gardener and allergy sufferer, found herself at the centre of the most ridiculous interstellar cultural exchange in the history of the galaxy. But that, as they say, is a story for another time, as the sun set on this most unusual day, casting a warm glow over the small midwestern town. One thing was certain. The relationship between Earth and the wider galaxy would never be the same, or because of a yawn, a sneeze, and a group of overly enthusiastic alien scientists who learned that sometimes. The best way to understand a species is simply to share a laugh with them, and somewhere up in orbit, the AI of the Alien Research Station logged the day's events, filing them under a new category. Human-alien relation. The sneeze that launched a thousand ships. 